So welcome to, I believe, episode six of the series now. Um, it's going to be an exciting one. It's heading into what can only be described as a relatively savage training weekend. So I'm currently sat planning uh, my routes. We're going to go through some carbohydrate loading uh, protocols and stuff like that as well. But to cut to the chase, tomorrow I have a 31 mile trail run. On Sunday, I will be spending four hours with 25 pounds of load on in uh, mountainous regions of the Lake District. So I'm doing the whole training week in the Lake District. So we just sat here finalizing the route planning and then we're going to bring together the administrative points and look at nutritional interventions and how we're going to approach and how we're going to tackle it. Um, I'll get some stuff recorded for you over the weekend then we'll catch up again on Monday, Tuesday to see how I fared. So it's going to be a hell of an episode. Hopefully things go to plan. I don't actually like hope. I think it's for fools. But, you know, we're confident everything's going to go to plan because we're planning appropriately. So let's get stuck into it. So when you are planning exceptionally large, long routes, so on and so forth, um, you obviously need to have a degree of professionalism and technical proficiency to do so. So the two apps that I'm using are Strava and Training Peaks. So Training Peaks is where everything is kind of actually scheduled. Um, and that's how we know that obviously we're doing a 31 mile run. And what I do is I use Strava to basically find the routes. Now, if it's like a normal 5, 10, 15, 15 mile run, then I won't really pay any more attention than that other than I'll create the route or find the route. Um, Strava is synced to Garmin, which basically means that this acts as like a turn-by-turn -turn GPS on your wrist in the event, which is phenomenally useful. If you don't have a Garmin, I'm not by any way sponsored or affiliated, nor do I hope to be, but it is really, really useful for that. I'm sure other watches can do it as well, but when you're doing a longer and longer distance, it is gonna be a game changer. And Strava will sync with my Garmin, that will tell me what to do. But when I'm tackling longer runs, so like 20, 25, 30 miles, you then got to be really considered and deliberate with like fueling strategies and you know what you're letting yourself in for and how the terrain looks and stuff like that. So you can kind of preempt when it's about to get hard, when you can coast, so on and so forth. So what I've basically you've done, I've brought it up on the desktop app rather than on, on the, the phone app because I'm just studying the elevation plot a little bit. Um, you might have seen on the screen, there is a particularly aggressive climb in this route that I found. Um, so if we look for the segment, well, this is this is what it is. So if look, you're basically climbing very aggressively for an entire three miles. And then beautifully, the little icon on the map will track where that actually is. So I know when I get to roughly the halfway point south of Cartmel Fell, um, it's, it's time to fucking hang out. So then what I know, what I can do with that, having that knowledge is when I get into Cartmel Fell, I'll start feeding more. As in, you know, I'll start taking on more food, start taking on more fluid about 20 minutes prior to arriving there because then I'm going to have the best chance of, you know, not fucking dying on an ascent like that. Then if you scroll down to the segment section, you can actually see where someone's been kind enough to, to map and plot a lot of this stuff. And I believe it is the Stavely and Carmel Common Climb. So maybe someone's watching this who's done that or has created this route or has, has attempted this route before. And yeah, over the first three miles, it's an average of 15.2% incline gradient. So it's gonna be uh, it's gonna be pretty spicy. So yeah, just doing a little bit of due diligence, a little bit of planning um, to make sure everything goes as swimmingly as possible tomorrow. That what I am deliberately using to consume loads of sugary carbohydrates is also a lot of people are told and perceived to be a good breakfast cereal. What a fucking time to be alive. A ton of biscuits. So we've just been shopping. Any of you who have watched the previous episodes will know that I normally am not an advocate of going to the supermarket, A, because it's a fucking waste of time, B, because it gets on your tits, and C, because if you went like I just did, hungry, uh, you end up coming out with shit that you really did not need. But we went there to get additional carb sources. So obviously we've done uh, the ordinary weekly shop, which is pretty systemized. Um, but given that we, are aiming to get about 830 grams of carbohydrates in today. 
probably the same again tomorrow. Uh, we need some additional, so just like fruit juice and high carbohydrate fruits, uh, foods. And um, we'll talk through that in a moment. But yeah, lesson learned, don't go shopping hungry. I anticipated to be the ones with a fierce MDS, but actually they're like fucking butter. So they're getting packed for the 50k. A pair of shorts, just some Aussie rugby shorts for recovering and relaxing in. Uh, through dark leggings for the hike on Sunday. What I really like about the through dark leggings is they have foam pouches on both sides, which I know is a small detail, um, but it means you can fucking have like snacks and phone concurrently, which is pretty helpful. And what's also nice is they've got their top as well. And their top also has a fucking little slot on the side, which is niche, but helpful. Uh, so that's going in there. And then just some fucking kit from wronging it in. Now, maybe someone who's watching this could actually help elucidate this subject for me of recovery and compression wear. I've had these, no joke, since I was a 16-year-old rugby player and maybe superstition, but I tend to wear them after particularly arduous things and I have them for the past, like, 15 years. Whether it's placebo or not, I don't know, but I do tend to experience less swelling when I've used them. So maybe there's something in that. I'll be banging those on Saturday night and probably Sunday night as well. Because they're uber light, I may even look at taking them to the MDS. But uh, I think it's quite a divisive subject because obviously there's, there's companies with vested interest in saying they're really good. And then there's always scientists who have a vested interest in finding the truth. And then in between is probably the actual reality. And then, again, this yacht in a wind layer has paid for itself fucking 10 times over. The weekend that we're recording and doing this, of course, there's a storm warning in effect in the north of England, so it's going to be blowy as fuck. So that's going to pay for itself on that day. Right, that's pretty much all my clothing packed. And the OCD slash kit pest person inside me loves how, how well these packing cubes work. It's actually a consolidated module that you can just fucking rip in and rip out. Um, you don't have to go wading through shit to find out where stuff is. A new thing that we're also experimenting with through necessity is I tried to get a Gurney Goo, which is the brand I've most commonly heard spoken about. Couldn't get any on Amazon Prime. So I've got this bad boy. It's essentially fucking chub rub cream. Um, I've been struggling with it to various degrees for a couple of months now, but it gets to the point when you're doing like 20 miles plus where you'll pretty much draw blood on the inside of like where your thighs meet is one of the many downsides of having slightly thicker legs. So this is like a lubricant with um, aloe in it, which is also uh, slightly antiseptic as well. So I'm going to bang some of that on uh, in the old crotchal zone before embarking on the 50k tomorrow. Recording now. If you go out and you do a lot of long distance running slash hiking in remote areas of the world or wilderness, it's pretty responsible to carry one of these. It's a space blanket. It's one of those foil jobbies that you see people wearing at the end of marathons and stuff. Um, might seem like a small and relatively innate bit of kit, but if the worst does happen, and no one thinks it's gonna happen to them, but it's as simple as you could sprain your ankle, which means you're stuck on a hillside, can't get off, weather comes in, it's cold, it's rainy, you're gonna end up in a shit state very, very quickly. So literally like a fucking 50 grand bit of kit costs you about 10, 15 quid online in your day sack is you know the difference between you being a liability and you being able to you know, self-support in that situation or help someone else who's in the same situation. So a really invaluable bit of kit that goes in the day sack at all times. In case you're wondering about the cushion in there, this is a ridiculously light day sack. There is like no padding at all. 
So because I'm artificially loading this, I, it's not full of the normal stuff you need to, to exist. I'm filling it with water bottles. Um, you will get bruises and blisters on your back if you don't have something to cushion that and just take a little bit of the friction off your back. So that's why the cushion there. This would be the warm kit that I man pack to carry with me. This lightweight Arc'teryx hard shell again, fucking outstanding bit of kit, super light. And I have tested it in some of the most extreme weather conditions you're gonna get in the UK. And it's risen to every challenge, so highly rate that. And I'll just stuff all this in there. Carbohydrate shoes, these will be what I take on the MDS. I think I've spoken about those before. They are very, very good. I get a lot of messages being like, are they good? Um, I guess take it for granted that if I'm using it, I, I, I have a high value of it. So yes, they are legit. In no way sponsored, affiliated, nor do I expect, expire, or hope to be, but they are a really good product that is sought out and um, they do a very, very good job. Same with the drink mix. Um, the reason that I particularly like this, again, not sponsored or affiliated, don't wanna be, is um, A, it has a thousand milligrams of sodium per liter, or technically per 500 mil, so per two scoops, which is market leading, and 60 grams of carbohydrates per serving, which again is the optimal ratio of glucose to fructose. Now, why that matters is because ordinarily carbohydrate intranutrition drinks are just one full of shit that can allow them to uh, get higher propensity, or sorry, higher uh, density of carbohydrates into you, but your gut is only going to be able to digest and assimilate a certain amount of a single carbohydrate source, especially when you're under stress and duress like a run. If you have the correct ratio of glucose and fructose, you can imbibe more carbohydrates and it won't upset your gut. So that's a win for that reason. It's also not disgustingly sickly from like an artificial sweetener perspective. So you can keep consuming it for like five or six hours at a time and not feel like you want to vomit. So it's really good. So in this bag, which I promise my mum did not pick and pack for me, it's just a cooler bag to get things to location, uh, is a selection of the carbohydrate and general calorie sources that I'm gonna be using over the next 48 hours. Um, the vast majority that are making up the staple are foods that I'm going to be using on the MDS. So cream of rice and beef protein powder is a staple. Uh, real meal bars and resilient nutrition, uh, high protein nut butter, they're a staple, they're going in. But these are largely kind of the ancillaries that are, I'm going to use um, just this evening, tomorrow evening, and then Sunday after the event as well. Um, rice cakes, really like them, rice based, very palatable, hyper digestible, so they're a win. Jaffa cakes, 10 of these bad boys, which you can fucking inhale in like three seconds, 87 grams of carbs, hundreds of calories, very, very easy to get down. Again, we've got carbohydrate sources in the form of bagels and pancakes. Um, something in here is actually a birthday present for Louis, so if you're watching this, know that I did think of you and pan ahead, brother. Um, we've got loads of rice, we've got fucking jam, we've got bananas, we've got honey. Um, so all these are hyper palatable ways that we can add very low fat carbohydrate to, to our kind of meals. Um, and yeah, that, that's pretty much it. So what I'm going to do is get a landy pack and head off to the lakes, which is going to be about 90 minutes from here, maybe a bit longer given it's a Friday afternoon and someone's probably driven into a central reservation. So it might be a couple of hours, get there, get some food on board, settle in, relax, double check the roof tomorrow. And then there's nothing left to do it, but to fucking do it. So whilst we're on the topic of food selections, carbohydrates, so on and so forth, today is event plus one, so the day before. Um, so I've been doing carbohydrate loading. Now, this is a concept that largely misunderstood and misrepresented. It's really relatively simplistic. You can go into real depth scientifically about how many carbohydrates you're going to need to basically fill your glycogen stores with in advance of an event. My experience though, is that people tend to get really caught up in the data and the minutiae and actually miss the bigger picture. They'd get themselves so stressed and so worked up and expect that it's gonna be a miraculous like transformation of their performance the next day that are actually then you know, really, I guess, underwhelmed. What we're basically looking to do is ensure that our glycogen stores are absolutely full, like absolutely full. That's all we can aspire to achieve. You can eat before doing that and then you get gly glycogen super compensation so your body can actually store more than the ordinary it can store like 110 percent which you think shouldn't be possible but it's, it's an, uh, a physiological phenomenon that happens if you deplete carbohydrates first we haven't done that we've just looked to increase carbohydrate intake today so i've aimed at 10 grams of carbohydrate per kilo of body weight now as a caveat here a lot of people in the carbohydrate load just eat any old shit. They're banging in pizzas, fucking ice cream, all that sort of shit. 
in order to keep overall gastric stress and caloric load down, you need to make uh, subtractions from your fat intake. So for me today, my fat intake goal was 42 grams. So that's why you have to use really high carbohydrate sources with very low fat intake because fat will slow gastric emptying, make you feel really full, make you feel really lethargic, and it will generally fuck the process up for you. So fat's really low, protein remains consistent. So my um, carbohydrate intake today was 840 grams of carbohydrate. And you've seen me eating all day, like there's nothing else that's gone in additionally to or different than that. You've seen exactly what it is I'm eating. Now, what that should mean is tomorrow, I don't have to be as stressed or make as much of a concerted effort to try and consume fuckloads of energy in the morning. I'm not training today, I'm not exercising. Sleep is glycogen sparing, which means that when I wake up, I'll be in a high carbohydrate available state, high energy availability. So I'll top that up with probably just a real meal bar or something light for breakfast, bit of caffeine, um, hydrate with electrolytes, and then I'll be good to go. Now, the honest reality is you can only hope to fuel about 90 minutes of exercise um, with whatever you have stored in, in liver and tissues. Beyond that, it's then going to be the job of your intra-exercise uh, sort of feeding schedule. So, you know, over the course of the weekend, we'll talk to that about, you know, how I'm using gels, powders, food sources to facilitate that, to make sure that I stay above sort of 50% glycogen stores. But in a nutshell, that's been the approach today. And now let's see how well it worked. Right, so that is now us at half eight on Sunday morning. Uh, as anticipated, I didn't sleep particularly well last night. My nervous system was just through the roof, um, owing to the stress and strain that I've just put it through. Now, that's actually quite uh, a valuable lesson to learn, though, because it basically means I probably can't count on restful sleep during the uh, most of the MDS, because I, I would assume my nervous system is going to be the same state. So I can now start to look over the next couple of months at various interventions I might be able to make from a holistic perspective and also maybe um, from a supplementary perspective, like magnesiums and so on and so forth, that might help me get some restorative, restful sleep. But nevertheless, adrenaline is obviously high this morning, so I feel good. Um, and that's the trap that a lot of people fall into. They feel fucking immense after insurance events it's because they're, they're just simply running on adrenaline at some point that will come down so i i imagine monday tuesday will be a little bit uh tough this week body wise touch wood everything is holding up really quite well i had some really severe well, i say severe i had some notable blisters uh yesterday so i drained those out they've reinflated um so i'm just going to pull a little bit more fluid out of those this morning um and then pack my feet tape them up um, and then we're good to go. So as I mentioned, you know, we've got um, Louis here sat just behind me from the hardcore directing staff. We've got Jack coming and a couple of clients from the Brotherhood. So morale's high, um, should be a good day. Really looking forward to it. The clouds are starting to, to break and we can see some mountain tops. So let's just fucking get stuck in and, and see how it feels. Harry's been doing a, a really, really good job of making sure that we've got a professional touch to everything that we do with regards to lighting and stuff. Uh, he did brief me pretty comprehensively on how I should light and organise this filming in his absence. Um, I'm really sorry, mate, if I fucked it up. Uh, so that's me back in from the 50k today. Um, pretty fucking tired, got a little bit ratty at points. Um, what I'm going to do is just run through a stop five protocol um, to talk about, you know, how, how I perceive it went. So situation, you know what happened um we'll start at the very beginning last night was a fucking terrible night's sleep i love the lake district it's one of my favorite areas on earth um but unfortunately it's spoiled sometimes by people and the people in the apartment next to me i decided it was appropriate to go out on the piss and then have a house party till 3 a.m so sleep was a little bit broken and there was some trepidation in me uh, anyway so sleep wasn't great got up had very simple breakfast uh cup of coffee and then went out and ran a 50 kilometer loop um, around Windermere. So all the way down the eastern border around the southern shore and then back up again uh, and, and finishing in Ambleside. In terms of things that went well, well, I'm fucking here. Uh, as many of you who have watched previous episodes of the YouTube series will, will know, um, I've been nursing a bit of an injury in the right knee. And I've got a little bit of, of some, some posterior tissue behind the right knee is unhappy, uh, but it never went above a three out of 10 on the pain scale. So I think it's a bit of pain and discomfort, but it's not injury. So that has something that definitely went well. Cadence felt brilliant, technique felt good. Um, I deliberately was restricting carbohydrate to uh, simulate intake in terms of how it will be on the MDS. Um, and there was a couple of times I felt a bit lightheaded, but other than that, you know, really not concerned whatsoever. So that's 50K done with three liters of water, 
and averaging 30 grams of carbohydrates per hour and a real meal bar with caffeine in um, and yeah really felt felt pretty good uh opportunities now <clears throat> i said going into this I, I i wanted as few expectations on myself as possible um and i thought okay 30 miles never done that far before in my life in one go let's see if we can do it in six hours which averages out at uh, at 12 minutes per mile because you kind of have an inclination about what 3,000 meters of elevation might look like and what it might feel like to run 30 miles <laughs> the Lake District is a fucking law unto itself when it comes to the extremity of the terrain, the weather systems, you know, like a good a good four hours a day out of six hours of 20, I think it was we finished in the end, was spelt, spent like ankle deep in cold water, boggy mud, shit, going up steep hills, back down like technical descents. Um, it was a pretty hard day at the office and my feet are telling the tale. Like I've never typically suffered with blisters um, and I probably can't show you the state of my feet right now because it will get banned. We'll get a ban from YouTube, but they're, they're pretty severe. So I've got a foot care kit with me. I'm going to start stringing some fluid out, getting some iodine on and packing them and taping them ready for tomorrow. Um, so that's another opportunity for us to improve in terms of what I'm doing with my foot. Um, point to take forward, the first 10 miles felt really quite easy. Um, and I think that actually lulled me into a false sense of security. You know, I had that bit of discomfort behind the knee uh, and, you know, with a shit night's sleep last night and other things like, you know, I'll be real honest, there's a part of your brain and anyone who wants to admit this, fair enough, if you don't, you know, that's, that's your own initiative. But um, you kind of think, well, if my knee blows up, then, you know, at least it's honourable. At least I can fucking just biff it out of this and it's not my fault I didn't jack. Um, and you kind of have to wrestle with those thoughts a little bit, if I'm being really honest. The first 10 miles felt you know, really pretty comfortable. Between mile 10 and mile 20, there was a lot of climbing. Um, I mapped this route on Strava, and it informed me there was going to be about 3,000 feet of elevation. Turns out it was actually closer to 4,000. So that was, that was pretty fucking tough, and a few, a few cheeky little surprises in there. Um, I was on a high because I got to the summit, you know, around about mile 15. Um, and then it was quite challenging terrain and technical descending coming down to mile 20. Mile 20, I was like, right, last 10 miles, you know, we can we can smash this. And then mile 21, I started having a bit of a tantrum and a bit of a fucking sense of humour failing because uh, I was just so fucking sick of having cold, wet feet. I could feel the blisters filling up. Um, the terrain was just a fucking bag of dicks, if I'm being real honest with you. It's a beautiful area of the world, but not when it's, you know... Um, when you're under a little bit of pressure to perform. And I constantly had to make decisions in terms of like, I wanted to just fucking open my legs up and just get it over and done with. But I've got another 16 miles uh, with load to do tomorrow. So I was like, right, well, I don't want to cause any unnecessary strain, stress or potential for injury that's then going to set me back tomorrow. So you're going to have to just fucking suffer patiently. So between mile 21 and 27, I was like sticking my bottom lip out and you start like personifying the mountains because one of the most challenging things about the route today is, you know, you'll do like a great bit of tarmac and you get into a nice routine and rhythm that you'll turn off that and it's back into gopping terrain and you're ankle deep in water and shit. And then you, you overcome that. And you're like, oh, yeah, that's the hard bit done with. And then you go again into, and that happened most, probably half a dozen times. And every time that happens, you, know, you have to really check your expectations. Otherwise, you do start to get a little bit disheartened. And then you start to fucking just throw temper tantrums. And that's the beginning of the end, unless you're able to be really emotionally aware and, uh, and, and begin to regulate those emotions. So I was having a bit of tantrum. And I was personifying the mountain like the mountain was just trying to fucking test me or take it out on me. It's like, it's just a fucking bit of land, mate. It's, it's, that's all it is. Is. so it's actually my response to what i'm seeing that is making it hard for me so stop being a pussy like just surrender to the fact that it's hard and just fucking suffer patiently and get on with it so mile 27 i've finished spitting my dummy out and then to be honest like mile 28 uh, to 30 just seemed to go on don't know what that was uh, but mile mile 28 to 30 just seemed to go on seemingly forever um, the way you come back into Ambleside on that route, Ambleside, like the, the, the township is really obscured until the last minute. So it just felt like it was never going to come. And when I came, I was like, fucking hell. Like, we, we did it. We got it done. Um, so then immediate intention was on uh, replenishing. So straight into the cup and get me some fucking chalky milk. Uh, the kind of hand when it comes to recovery um, from, from causing such as that. Um, we'll get loads of food on. Uh, this afternoon, I'm going to admin my feet, so I brought some needles and stuff because I'm just going to have to start pulling fluid out of those, get some uh, iodine solution on to them, wrap them up, um, and, then, and then get them taped and ready for tomorrow. Admin kit, and then just generally wind down and relax for the evening. Um, tomorrow, yeah, we've got fucking... 
16 miles with more elevation, um, carrying low tomorrow, carrying about 22 pounds, much, much slower pace. But you know, the wonderful thing about the hardcore directing staff is the boys just never fucking leave you to your own. Like they're always gonna make sure that like, if one of us is doing something crazy, which ordinarily one of us is at various points in the year, the lads will get fucking stuck in um, and, and help you through that. And also our clients as well, it's one of the most beautiful things uh, when it comes to fruition of, of being part of uh, a, a high performing community of like minded people. When the clients find out that you're doing it and spending time with them in the mountains, they're like, yeah, fucking Roger that. Like, we'd, we'd love to be there. We'd love to sort of, you know, misery loves company, all that sort of good stuff. So I'm actually really, really looking forward to tomorrow. So that's my piece. Um, yeah. All, all around, a lot of a lot of positives to take away from that. A lot of opportunities for us to work on moving forward. Some cool things to take forwards, um, and I've got to try and get some circulation back into that one specific middle finger. I don't know if I'm going to see how white that's gone, but um, hopefully, that made for good viewing. So today is Tuesday, following the long training weekend on Saturday, Sunday. So Saturday we ran 50k, about 4,000 feet of elevation around the borders of Lake Windermere. And then Sunday, some of the guys from the Hardcore Directing staff and our clients joined us uh, for a 20K, which was enormous fun. Went for a car afterwards. <laughs> it was all sort of good stuff. Um, yesterday was a full total rest day, so I didn't do any training. Did go for a sauna, did some mobility work, but to a great extent, it was a rest day. And now you're joining us on Tuesday and we are back into training. So in a moment, about to go and get warmed up. And then we've got a five mile run this morning. Very, very gentle pace. Probably take Nile, the dog out with me then strength and conditioning this evening and then across this week is a little bit of a deload so we're accruing around about 30 miles this week which in itself is nuts because I am a self-proclaimed non-runner so for a deload to be 30 miles is uh, is pretty insane but it really speaks to the power of consistently following a well-engineered and strategically thought out plan because it fucking works over the course of the weekend I was uh, pleasantly surprised about how I'm not going to say effortless but how, accompli- uh, how achievable 30 mile run was on the Saturday. And then again, how good my body felt on the Sunday because of the recoverability that we've built up by consistently training in a, in a state of semi-fatigue, uh, adhering to the process, trusting the process and just doing the work. So it really does speak to the actual value of adhering to a process, having a plan and knowing what it is you're doing and why you're doing that. So that's me just back in from a five miler, <clears throat> which on paper doesn't sound a lot, but uh, you know, 48 hours ago, I ran 70 kilometers. And I kind of want to take a moment to discuss that because today I experienced every shade of hateful emotion on that run. My legs were hurting. I was like, fuck this, fuck YouTube, fuck the people that are watching it, fuck you, Harry. I was like, fuck everyone. Um, and you're going to experience that. And I think it's really important that I'm transparent with this and I don't just like talk about, oh yeah, I find it easy, so on and so forth. But then what I want to extrapolate from that is, well, what would your life be like if rather than subscribing to those beliefs and taking them as factual, if you learn how to regulate your emotions? Because that's all that this is. Being able to run 70 kilometers in a weekend in itself requires emotional regulation. Then what about the specific ability to recover quickly and appropriately and did a four days work in the office yesterday. And then today, looking down the barrel of this run, which I did not want to do, being able to regulate my emotions to get out the door and get it done. And then during the run, when you're experiencing hateful emotions, being able to take the lesson from that and, and, and what, what would your life be like if you took more from any challenge than you allowed it to take from you. So that you had a heightened degree of self-awareness, you regulate those emotions and you walk back into it saying, right, I've taken something away from that. I know what needs to be done and now I'm going to commit to action and commit to doing that. And I'm not bluffing this, I'm not blagging this. This is as real and raw as it's gonna get. You know, people can't do these, these feats and then put an act on the whole way. That's, the whole, that's exactly why I did this. But you gotta realize that like sixes and sevens don't get to lead eights and nines. What I mean by that is if you're if your self-awareness, your emotional regulation, your ability to communicate and have a fucking strong hard word with yourself and take your head for a shit, if you're scoring sixes and sevens or less on that, and you think you're gonna stand up and inspire, lead, coach, talk to, eights and nines, you're fucking dreaming. So ask yourself, like, what would your life be like if you stop subscribing to the belief that just because it's hard, you don't wanna do it? That just because you feel hateful and resentful, that you're not gonna do it. That just because you've trained hard and done a bit of a fucking run that you can't work. This is all about, this is the entire lesson of this entire series and you're seeing it real and raw and out unfiltered 
is the ability to fucking regulate one's emotions, to be aware, to take the lesson from it. And then we'll have a fucking shower, a quick change parade, to get some food on. And then we're into the office and then we're into meetings for the day. And my team need, deserve, and want the best version of me. Not one that's pissing and moaning and sticking my bottom lip out because it's been hard. It is your responsibility to deal with your shit. And everything that we do in the Hard to Kill program is not singular excellence in just being a great runner. It's being able to then have a heightened degree of self-awareness, regulate your emotions, take the mask off where you need to, take your head for a shit, and go into that new environment as the best version of yourself to lead others around you.